This is episode 33 with the Zmed Brothers, a great uh, duo from California now living in Nashville. Uh, these two brothers uh, are wonderful singers and, and great guys, and really enjoyed working with them uh, at our theater here uh, last summer. We sat down one night and did this podcast, and I really enjoyed it. Sit back and enjoy the Zmed Brothers. <laughs> All right, we're here with the Zamed Brothers. Did I say that correctly? Yeah. 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 How many people mess that up? We get Zmed, we get Smed, like an S kind of sound. Yeah. But, I mean, all of it works for me. As long as they're saying our name, I'm happy. But we actually, our, our grandfather, uh, when they came over from Romania in 52, it says on Ellis Island on the wall, it says Zmed, but... The family changed it to Smith when they were living in Chicago. Oh yeah. So when our parents met, my our dad was Adrian Smith, and then sometime in the the I, I guess it was 70s? in the early seventies they sw- switched it back to Zmed. Yeah. You know, which is which is cool. I mean, people might get it wrong. They want to put a vowel in between the Z and the M, but that's all good. Yeah. It doesn't get <laughs> demolished. It no. just it's just. A little tweaked here yeah. and there. <laughs> yeah. We always kind of say, imagine med, like medical, and just put a Z in front of it. So yeah. it's medical or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, but... That's that's great. Yeah. It's a good way. <laughs> Take yours medicine. Yeah. Yours meds. Yeah. yeah. As medley, we always... Yeah. yeah. So it's been great. Uh, you guys are performing here for at our theater here for two weeks uh, with your show that you've been touring with, uh, the Everly Brothers Experience. It was great because, you know, it's kind of a show... We have booked kind of unseen, but I saw the videos and, and, you know, you get a sense of, um, what it's going to be like. I was pretty blown away. I mean, I loved, I mean, I was captured from beginning to end, you know, that usually doesn't always happen, but yeah, you've, you've nailed the show. It's, it's really, really great. That means a lot. Thank you, Darren. Thank you. And you're, you cap the whole show off with hallelujah, which is it just kind of all of a sudden it was just like, wow. I mean, it's, that's you not, know, that, that song's been done a lot and sometimes it's really great. Sometimes it's not, and it's hard to make it your own. It's one of those songs that you do is that you, you better get this one right. Right. If you're going to do that song and you guys just nail it. And you know, I've heard it how many times now, probably 10 times or whatever it is. Yeah. In different and ways. And- yeah. And I love it every, you know, it captures me every yeah. single time. I just, you know, oh, wait, oh, I just love it. It, it works really, really well. You've done a really good job with that. Uh, thanks. Jeez. It's such Thank a great you. song. Thank it's a, it's amazing how certain songs just kind of pull it out of you too. Yeah. And that's but like, I, I like playing that song. Every time we get to the, that third verse, it feels a nice kind of ending to the show. Like I didn't come to fool you, you yeah. know, after we've been idiots, you it, know, it's been, <laughs> <laughs> it's been interesting watching you guys. Cause like, I, I can see myself in you guys a little bit where I, I always feel that I can, you know, no matter what situation, if you're being funny or if you're doing whatever on stage, but the song starts, you're able to take yourself to a place right away. Um, and I've always been able to do that for quite a while. I felt that I've always, no matter what's going on, I could, if I'm playing or something, I could just close my eyes or whatever I'm doing and zone in on mm. exactly what you're doing. And I can see that when I watch you guys, I can see it in your eyes almost where it's all of a sudden it's like you start singing and you're, you guys zone in to your songs. Um, and that's really important. They were quite, um, I feel like the songs doing anything well, singing a song properly requires it's, it's like a, it requires so all of your spirit to do it properly. Yeah. Uh, when there is yeah. this like, I mean, we, I mean, just being students of the music, there's a certain aesthetic that's going on in the music. And like every time you, you come to it, there's a, a certain level of focus. I mean, every time we're singing the harmony, like we, we can't lose our focus any moment. Cause if we do, it just like, it falls apart. Like I need to be watching him or just like, you know, cause I, I have to follow when he finishes a note or when he starts a note and yeah. the, even the intensity of how he's singing at that moment or, and I've catch myself like, well, I'm not listening. And I have to like, boom, just zoom right in and like have to hear his voice. And 
That's why I kind of kink myself a little bit towards him so I can kind of, out of the corner of my eye, see his mouth so I yeah. can like just use that as a visual reference. And, yeah, and I and also just every, you go for a note and every time you hit it, I mean... I can feel if I'm if I'm if we're off. It's just, yeah. and I f- I feel like most of the song is just trying to connect, and I mean, it it it, it doesn't always do that. Obviously, we're not perfectly on. I, that's just how it goes. But it's those moments that are worth it. But it takes so much focus. I, I mean, I feel like I'm off most of the time. I'm just constantly trying to be on. Yeah, I uh, could you could probably look at that way because you're um you've zoned so far in to the songs that you're probably on a such a different level than what the audience is right they're sort of at a surface level listening for you at you for the first time and you've captured them but you've done it so much that you've gone so deep it's like mixing an album almost like when you're sitting there and you you, know, you spent the last five hours on this song and you're mixing mixing and you've so deep into the song, you could come. I've I've done that a million times where you you hear every single detail, and a year later you come back to the song, and it's like you come back. I don't uh, I don't remember. Yeah, you know, you know, you spend hours on this thing, but you, there's stuff you don't listen to anymore because it doesn't. You know, not you're not in that zone at all. Totally. But it's it's good because you, um, I feel that you don't phone it in, right? You know, it's there's never there's a show that you do over and over again it's easy to do that. And, you know, I've seen a lot of people do that and it still works, you know, and it, it gets the point, but you can feel that you really, there's something about the way you sing these songs that you feel like you're taking, you're being transported back in time. And, and you can feel that the audience is, is connecting to those songs and those feelings and from those, that era that they grew up listening to that. And it, you do a good job of, of, you know, transporting, people back as a tribute you know i hate that word right um yeah. and i've talked about it a bunch of times before because there's a lot of tribute shows out there and some of them deserve that title right um and some sure. of them don't and like you mentioned you you're really doing an homage to to them and that's you yeah. know that's the better way to treat your show it's it's not really a tribute not when, to, you know when everyone like whenever we're out and about touring and stuff and people ask you know it comes up in conversation like oh what do you do and the i always like have this little struggle with how do i present what we do yeah and stuff because i know everyone has different associations with the word tribute act or um but we kind of have fallen into just saying that like oh we're it's a history preservation show that like we tell a lot of history we do some you know jokes but it's you know we pay respects to this group that had a huge influence and like we kind of try and walk around the fact that we we're a tribute band <laughs> yeah but it, there's nothing wrong with that but it's no I but understand we all the stigmas that are attached to it yeah i think it's become such a norm for tribute shows now and there's so many acts out there who are singers who can't make it and aren't making it for a reason because they're just not that great. But they think they can do a tribute and they can go into a thousand seat theater and do a show. There's a bunch of those acts that don't belong there, right? They're not at that level. Um, and then people go see them and they're disappointed and it ruins it for the next tribute act that comes because you don't know the difference between which one's good and which one's bad. Um, it's hard to hard to know. I mean, unless you really know who the the singers are, it's like an Elvis show. I mean, they vary like oh, yeah. crazy. Mm-hmm. And because it's being performed at your local theater and then you think you're going to a more prestigious place, you have an assumption that's going to be at a certain caliber, but it's it's more than often not that case. I think there's there's a very select few really good shows that are doing tributes to artists and the rest are, I don't even know how to put it. Um, you know yeah. what I mean? Oh, there's, there's, you know, there's also, I mean, there's levels to every type of music, but I think there's some people out there really doing a great job at it. Um, I think it comes down to are, an intention, I suppose. Mm-hmm. I mean, that the reason why we started the group was we were looking on like 
I mean, there's there's several converging reasons why, but one of the big things was we looked and saw that no one was doing a show like this that we thought the way it sh- we feel it should be done yeah. is like really about the history, like like what did this group do to people and why are they and like that's what's interesting to us and um and also why why aren't they as appreciated as as um or as household a name as elvis or something like that just yeah. um, that was that was another part of it i mean yeah they're wearing the suits and you know we have a, a, a good friend who's been doing a john lennon a, a kind of an impersonation thing he fills in for the fab four and does i think he's doing the bootleg show now um and he's so talented at doing the voice and doing all that stuff and we knew right away we're like we're not that we're not those guys you know and even if we were to put together a show uh an everly show it wouldn't feel right it would feel so weird looking at Dylan and saying, Hey, Phil, like, yeah. Like, yeah. What? I, I, we think the, the more interesting story is why are two young punks? Oh, we're not that young, but two young punks now in 2019 doing a show on, you know, this music from the late fifties. Like what, like that story, the, the actual story I think is more interesting well, than like, this is a part putting of our, on a, f- a, sh- a facade or something, but even though we do a little bit of a comedy thing, I, I think it has to do with the fact that the Everly show that this is a part of our process yeah. of, of evolution and just learning. Um, it's been incredible to learn, learn about the Everly brothers catalog and their history and how, how they're tied to the past and the future. And it's opened up a whole new world of, of music to us. And, yeah. Uh, for that, I'm f- forever grateful. And I don't know where it's going to go, but we have a lot of ideas and we're in, we're, I mean, it took us to Nashville. We live in Nashville now, which is incredible. And here we are in, you know, uh, what is this technically bright Ontario? Yeah, it's a big step above Nashville. Yeah, yeah <laughs> big time. No, but it's We've just the cra- big time. But it's crazy that we're here. You know yeah. that uh, what brought us here, and and uh, we just want to keep following that and honoring it. Well, the cool thing is, um, I think the catalog is really great, um, and it's really musical. And I, you know, you've been doing it for a while now, but I'm sure you can tell by the way you're singing that you're not tired of it. I mean, uh, yeah, it's it's it is kind of crazy that every time I'm excited to sing these songs because there's a there's a meditation to them and yeah. I mean the, they're amazingly written songs and there's just there's a it's yeah I mean it's poetry it's it's meditation that's the biggest thing the I, Bryant's material the the songs like the ballads in particular are just eternal songs yeah uh, devoted to you and all I have to do is dream just th- those songs just don't get old to me yeah. Uh, um, yeah, yeah, it, it, you you can certainly tell that, and I think you know there's other tribute type shows that you could tell that could get really tired of some of the stuff, definitely, really, really quickly. <laughs> and you know, and also you know, seeing the shows a bunch of times, I can't imagine it being sung much better than what you guys are doing. It there's a magic between the two of you that really work. You know, being family and being brothers being able to tap in the way you, you guys do, there's a level there that I don't think a lot of people could achieve. You've picked the right thing to do. I mean, I it seems as if when you watch the show that you're not watching a tribute, or you're not watching a couple guys who just decided to put a show together to make a living. It feels like you are meant to sing those songs. Wow, you know what I mean? Does wow. that make sense? Yeah, that's incredible yeah. that you that you'd feel that way. I well, mean, well, um, but uh, it's, it's I mean, it is it's true, true though. We feel yeah. that too. I mean, yeah. it's and I it's so wonderful to hear that from someone else yeah. say that because you don't know if it makes it through. Oh, it does. You know? Yeah, it totally does. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's definitely yeah. I mean, there's something. I mean, a lot of similarities that just kind of came about that we've noticed, like with. I mean, the fact that I'm the younger brother, I have a higher, naturally higher voice, and the same went with Phil, and being the younger and higher voice, and um, just, just kind of a, the fact that we grew up with it, too, is just kind of part of our childhood in a strange way with, you know, our father having done, you know, 
doing musical Greece for such a long time, and that music just was the soundtrack to our youth in the same way that folks, well, not the same way, but people who grew up in the 50s, that was their soundtrack. But so there's something that runs deep for us, I think, just yeah. because of that's like our first memories are connected. Our 50s music. 50s, yeah, connected yeah. to that time and or just that sound and stuff. So it's. And also the, 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 somewhat the culture even though it's a, a a weird theaterized version of the culture 50s culture people were showing up in poodle skirts and oh, yeah. and, and doing the dances and everything so uh in the first time that dylan and i ever we used to vocalize with our dad backstage and i mean just kind of mockingly towards yeah. him like you know and the, but uh they'd have a chorus mic backstage and anyone who was off stage could sing in the big chorus numbers, and we would do it regularly, singing, you know, Chang Chang, Changity Shang Chu Bob, you know, like going yeah. through all that stuff in Greece. And uh, you, you don't know. Like, I had no idea that it was going to have such an effect on me at the time. It took a long time. It's interesting when I, uh, I think when I got your writer, and there's was, there was part of it where it, where it said, you know, basically pre-show music, you know, idea of late fifties, early sixties. I'm thinking. Why would I want late fifties or something? Then I thought to myself, "Gosh, it is that time." I, you know, you you kind of think it was later than that, right? It was, um, you know, you almost think into the seventies, but their time period really was, you know, yeah. fifty-seven that, to sixty-two. Yeah, was like it, when they were hot, really hot, and that's and it kind of threw me for a minute because I didn't think it was back quite. That makes that sense far. though, because they. Yeah. I read this that they sold more records in the 70s than they did when they were together. During their hiatus, their Warner Brothers came out with the greatest hits. Yeah. And that was like the era of greatest hits compilation stuff and it just, you know, it sold off. so well. Yeah. yeah. So let's go back um and find out a bit more about you guys. So where did you guys kind of grow up? Where were you born? Are you born both in the same yeah the same words. same hospital Santa Monica, Santa Monica hospital in in uh, Southern California yeah um, yeah I mean it's uh, and I mean L A was home but every summer we would kind of just go with our dad wherever he was traveling doing shows plays and stuff um, and that was pretty much consistent throughout our whole upbringing childhood formative years and even into our teens and early twenties like he's always just traveling doing shows and stuff and so that's kind of been a consistent thing so we kind of had this like rooted life with our mom in yeah. la um and then every like summer time we'd have off we'd just be like where's he and we just kind of visit him and yeah and all that so might as well you know tell the audience who your dad is oh, yeah, i think it's pretty sure. cool yeah our, our, so our dad's name is adrian zmed and he was um uh, born in Chicago, and he got his first gig uh, as an actor in 77, I think it was, uh, as it was the original touring company of Greece. And I think that he is technically maybe the 15th or 16th Danny Zuko in that, that first production. Yeah. But he did it for an entire year. That was his first gig. And our mom, it was right after our, our parents got married, and uh, and she did hair on that tour. And then they just, they were trying to decide at the end of that year, do we live in Danbury, Connecticut and do the musical theater thing? Or do we move to Los Angeles and do pilot season? And they decided to move in 78 to, to Los Angeles. And, uh, you know, that's kind of where they started cultivating. They had some, bought some property and he started doing all the pilots. But dad also, he did, um, he was like Bozo the Clown sidekick for a while. He big. Well, that comedy. was much later, though. That was later. Yeah. yeah, but yeah, he he was yeah. So he's done like Grease Two, uh, Bachelor Party with Tom Hanks and T.J. Hooker with William Shatner. Those like the film and television. He hosted Dance Fever for a couple years. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so oh, yeah. what was his what was his first kind of bigger show? What came first out of that kind I of th- bunch? Was I it think the, the biggest thing was the first I think it was thing. Grease Two was the first thing yeah. that he did. And uh, and that kind of coincided with Bachelor Party because he and Tom Hanks, it, it was both of their you know earliest movies, and yeah. both of them were saying to each other, "Our career is over. Like this movie's, this is insane. Like what's what are we doing? You know, we're gonna get pigeonholed." And of course, Tom didn't go on to do anything, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's so crazy. Uh, 
but yeah, I think that was kind of it. I mean, the, the pilots kept him probably in business enough to to live in L.A. But those he, two. But things musical were huge. theater was his bread and butter of thirty yeah. some odd years. I mean, like probably four or five times every like for a certain consecutive amount of summers we would go uh, he was living in new york and we would just broadway he was doing broadway so he did blood brothers with carol king and the cassidy brothers and um and greece he was doing for a long time on he did broadway. so many i mean uh, he he was in this uh, play called children of eden uh where he played noah and adam and uh falsetto land uh, little shop of horrors i remember visiting that set when we were little kids and he freaked me out by you know putting having the plant eat me you know and the, and then the other guy was on the other side and he took me in as well i'll never forget that the chorus used to dress me up as a girl put a wig on me and stuff my dad would always get so angry like don't do that to my son <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh, that's pretty that, weird that, yeah well I, you know of course i watched tj hooker for you know how long was that on do you know you remember I, gosh Six probably years, from 84 years? until 87 or 88 yeah yeah it was he on the whole time yeah yeah, yeah there was, was a seven, certain time yeah. i think that shatner wanted a dog to be his sidekick instead of my dad so, so, he, so he had him shot sh- yeah he had him shot <laughs> <laughs> you know i've also heard that that, <laughs> that's funny that in the uh that it was actually written into the contract that no one could run ahead of Shatner in a running scene. Oh yeah. Yeah. I could see that. <laughs> yeah. Well, <That's> funny. <laughs> there's also, there were some scenes where they were in the car and you know, it was just shot from the, the waist up. And my dad said that, you know, see that shot right there. We were watching it together. We're not wearing any pants. <laughs> it, was, it was so hot out in the, the San Fernando Valley. Yeah. And uh, there was another shot where they're they were getting some air going, and and Shatner's toupee was flopping. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. And and my dad's. Well, you know, let's not chat on Shatner. So. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone else does. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, because I remember it was funny because the the first show here at our theater, and you you mentioned it in the show, but I'm I, I'm pretty sure I was busy, you know, looking what's coming up next, and I wasn't hundred percent i kind of missed what you kind of said i heard you were talking about it but i really didn't pick it up and then afterwards i was like hey did you, hey, did you hear who, who their dad was and i was like mom's like yeah he was on some tv show and, just, and then she couldn't remember quite what the tv show because she never watches tv and uh so i paid attention the next day i was like holy smokes <laughs> yeah, yeah. Listen, i watch dj hooker all the time that was fantastic so oh, that's um, awesome oh my goodness we, he's we i mean i gotta say man, i I admire, like, he's been such a role model because, I mean, he's never stopped working. He's just been so consistent. It's been such an example, I think. And for us, I mean, seeing his attitude and just how he constantly is just working his butt off. Yeah, I mean, the way that that both of our parents, you know, not what they said, but what they actually acted out in their lives was, was just huge. You know, you don't... Our dad was always kind. He was always kind of the, you know, in in terms of the cast, he was more of the fatherly figure. And of course he was in terms of musical theater is like the only straight guy in musical theater. Yeah. Um, but there was, he, he was always just indiscriminately kind to everyone and, and made it work. Yeah. And the, I, you don't know how much of an effect that has on you until later. And, and we're just, that's what we're trying to do every day. You know, yeah. there's differing personalities on the road and all the different people you're working with and you just have to just make it work. Yeah. It's amazing what you don't realize you're picking up, especially when you're young, you just yeah. around it and you're being taught without you realizing that you're, you're being taught. Um, and then later on in life you realize Wow, that was really important. Yeah, um, you don't realize you're probably having fun and being kids, yeah. but there was a large part of that that you were like, "Oh, I I learned a lot." Um, yeah, yeah. It makes I think think a big, like even f- like um, f- from singing too. Like our dad would be warming up before shows, and we would just be making fun of him when he was doing his warm up, vocal warm ups and yeah. stuff. Mama, 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 mama. And but we didn't realize. Oh, we're actually emulating you know, the, a certain way to sing, you know, and that, you know, kind of is a good thing to be practicing at a young age, I guess. Yeah. But, indirectly. Yeah. It's like we learned yeah. kind of how to vocalize just by making fun of him. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There was that. Yeah. 
So yeah. what was it like growing up in L.A. as young kids? Um, was Well, I, I think that we were kind of removed. We, we grew up in... Uh, in Calabasas, California, uh, which is 35 minutes outside of, of downtown LA. So we, ne- we never lived in Beverly Hills or, you know, or yeah. Brentwood or anything like that. I mean, Calabasas was a little bit different in the late eighties and, uh, now it's, you know, much more built up, but, uh, yeah, we, I guess another important thing to mention is that our parents did split up when we were pretty young. Yeah. So that there was kind of this like this uh, like uh, you know dual lifestyle that was happening and stuff that, and we moved around a lot too. So every like three or four years we'd kind of move. Yeah, not with to our put mom. our dad under the the microscope or it's anything, just, but it's just the, the way things went. But Hollywood is a. I mean, it's, it is a, a strange place. It's a godless place and yeah. it's, uh, and I think it, it, you know, for a dad, he, he was always just trying to get, get a job. Like he just wanted to, to stay in work. So when Hollywood wasn't working out anymore, he took off for the road and was started yeah. doing all the different plays and that made things more difficult because our not only did our parents split up around that time I was in third grade so like eight years old but it, it meant that Dylan and I were having to travel as two little kids you know yeah. eight and four years old and you put I mean that'll bring two people closer I, I mean yeah I, we were each other's constant yeah. throughout throughout these like going back and forth and it's a long train you know plane journeys across the country to new york and uh yeah, i feel so sorry for some of those flight attendants all the crying i was doing <laughs> they they would bring me ice cream though and that was nice but yeah <laughs> but uh well yeah, you yeah. know and you know in the 80s not as common as it is now to you know for people separating and um obviously too you've got a dynamic where you've got you know it's not as if dad is now you know, in the next town over and, you know, you meet up on the weekends or whatever. It's like, that's a big thing to, to take in. Yeah, um, it was, it was, I mean, we kind of have always acknowledged that as kind of a bit of a, like an emotional roller coaster. I mean, everyone has some form of that, but. Yeah. And our, our, it's, it's interesting at the time and we were spending more time with our mom and, and she, you know, we're, the school years with her, you yeah. know, she's laying down the law, making sure we're taking, everything's taken care of. And then we'd go out with her dad and t- be traveling. We get and to go to water spoil parks. Us. Yeah. Yeah, we yeah. got, we got a pass to the West Edmonton mall, you know, for, yeah. for the whole summer. The, and, yeah. The fantasy land hotel we stayed in. Yeah. All that. yeah. And the, and it just, cre- there was this, like, I don't know. It, it definitely was fun, but it created tension because all of our time with her dad was fun. Yeah. And all of her time with her mom was like, you know, but, and we had fun with mom. Oh, too. of course we did. Of course we did. But it but yeah, just, you know, it's a different. Yeah. 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 And I think it took, it took me a while to r- really, um, understand what they both gave, gave us yeah. and, and be able to really understand, okay, now I know why you left dad. I know why you had to go out on the road and, yeah. as, as an entertainer. And, um, but we we've yeah. got we had some pretty f- amazing encounters too, like with that traveling that oh. that life I and mean, the we were just super into Chris Farley yeah. at this certain point, and we were flying out to go meet her dad in New York, and it just so happened that Chris Farley was getting on the same plane as us, and but uh, we didn't know. Mm-hmm. Well, we didn't know we I, we saw him in the line though, and we were about to get on, uh, and Dylan started going into his Matt Foley impression. Yeah, I was like, so into just <laughs> and, so into and him. And Dylan was I mean, Dylan's taller than me now and he's slend more slender and everything, but at the time he was a little pudge minster. Yeah. And, yeah. and and he starts he went into this thing and Farley was there. Yeah. And he noticed Dylan and he like leaned down almost like he was a linebacker, like yeah. to get leverage, and he gave us a huge thumbs up. Yeah. But but so our like unbeknownst to us, our mom had mentioned like our their father is Adrian and he was doing a big play on well, he Broadway. He was doing at the time. Greece on Broadway, the Tommy Tune production. Yeah. So and, and Chris our step, knew of our dad. Our yeah. stepmother was Sandy at yeah. the time. So there's a, on in Times Square there's a huge picture of her dad and our stepmom. Yeah. And so on the plane, not we didn't know this, but he comes from first class back to us, and you see him walking back, and 
oh my gosh, that's Chris Farley. And then the the lady with the, the cart with all the drinks and stuff, she's going by and he's, oh, pardon me, ma'am. And he backs up into the bathroom <laughs> yeah. and he comes to right up to us and he says, stewardess told me a couple kids were causing trouble back here. Yeah. He gave us a whole show. Oh, and that's like, fantastic. It was the most like ex- thrilling thing to like, he's just a, And then an he idol. waited for everyone to exit the plane and he walked out with us around oh, no his way. arms around our shoulders and our dad's waiting there and we walk out with chris farley <laughs> and he gave us a phone number and we visited the snl set l- later that week wow and yeah him so i mean that's another example of like we had no idea like that okay our dad he knew our dad and it was like a it was a nice such a kind gesture to do that to just a fellow entertainer to like yeah. and but like to have an experience like that is just yeah. like Holy moly. <laughs> yeah, Farley was or holy shnikes, I should say. I mean, say. he yeah. was he was like the he was like the son. He was just like when he was there, he was like this it was he had that thing. Yeah. And yeah, no, when he passed, it was like the yeah, like losing a friend. Like it was so devastating for us. Yeah. Oh, but yeah, moments yeah, like yeah. that, like on you know, with the lifestyle of growing up, like to have a moment like that was just so cool and and, um, and he would, I looked back, you know, he didn't have to wait for us. We were just two little kids and he was 28 years old when that happened. And it just kind of puts things in perspective. Like he didn't, this was a very giving person. Yeah. He just never yeah. stopped doing that. But yeah, but growing up in LA. <laughs> oh yeah. Asked. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. yeah uh, the, there were a lot of, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I met a lot of my, all my, my best friends are from there, but there was definitely, I remember someone complaining at my high school, Calabasas High School, uh, complaining about getting the wrong color Mercedes for her birthday. Or something. Oh, yeah. You know, like you have that yeah. as well. Those, um, that's beyond like first world problems. That's yeah. Like- it's, uh, it's so, <laughs> it's so sad and just, dis- and just sad, disgusting. And, but, uh, but yeah, there were great people there. Um, so what did you, when you were in school, what did you, Thing you know, I've wanted things. So I'm going to be a fireman. I'm going to be whatever. What did, what did you guys think? <laughs> he that wanted you to be become? a hot dog salesman. I was <laughs> so when I was like five or six years old, I remember visiting with my dad in New York, and I and and all around Central Park, people would have the hot dog stands. Like people would just be oh. care. And I was blown away by the fact that this guy. <laughs> he found he can it have out. hot dogs whenever he wants. <laughs> Figured it out. Me? <laughs> <laughs> so that was that blew my mind. And because my last name is Med, I was always the last person that would go in in school. I'd be the yeah. last person to answer. And it's almost like we I got forced into being the punchline because oh, I'd yeah. see what everyone else would do. Like I can't put doctor. Yeah. I can't do that. <laughs> so I, I, I don't know. I have a maybe it was me I don't know if I how genuine I was. But, but, but that yeah. was initially, I mean, I, yeah, I mean you, you, but you at like 12 or 13, you were super into hockey. You, we were both into sports. I mean, I played water polo and I was not a captain of the swim team for in uh, high school and stuff. And, but you were at 13, you heard what it was. It oh, was well, the early blues stuff. And, yeah, it was early blues that I just want, I just wanted to play guitar so badly. It just struck me like yeah. lightning. I was just, I have to do it. And I, we got my dad's guitar out of storage and I just have ever since been playing, but yeah. So I always wanted to do that. I was want to, I always wanted to play music and we saw that it was possible to make a living through our dad as yeah. an entertainer. Uh, but he always, you know, kept pushing, like have something to fall back on to, you know, go get your music degree so you can teach. And, I did teach for 12 years in LA. Uh, that's all, all I was doing was teaching kids. Um, so when you finished uh, high school, what did, what did you do after that? Did you- right out of high school, I went to uh, Cal State Northridge, and I, was, I went just directly into the music program, into the classical music program. And I did that for two years, but then, you know, I, I, pu- I wanted to play my own music, and I actually... It's so crazy that I did this looking back, but I moved to Boulder, Colorado with four friends of mine to try and make it as a band. Oh, yeah. We moved into a, a three-bedroom apartment, and I, I lasted nine months and moved back to L.A. I went to Musicians Institute for six months, uh, met a bass player and a drummer and a guitar player, and we started playing gigs, and I started teaching. Yeah. And I didn't go back to college since. 
but so many incarnations over time. Well, yeah, man, I, I right out of high school, I got a BA in fine arts. It was, took me four and a half years because I took a semester off to, I joined Zach's band in 2009 Yeah, and we did a tour and, uh, I was just kind of the arsenal guy. I would like play a little mandolin part or an electric guitar part or percussion part and then sing backup harmonies and stuff. But yeah. And then, yeah, after I graduated, I kind of full-time joined the band, but then I was just trying to figure out what else to do. I was working and odd jobs and stuff, but I had a band from 2006 until 2015 called the Janks. Yeah. And it was all over the place. It was, you know, kind of Beatles white album inspired or ween or something like that. Just, just weird and all over the place where every song was like a snapshot of a different, you know, Oh, that one's going to be like Steely Dan. That one's going to be, and it was our way of just having fun and exploring, but it, it's hard to have any kind of commercial success or anything if you're not yeah. finding your lane and just staying with it. But he joined that band. Yeah. 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 And that, that we were playing so much and it did. Yeah. You said it went through several different incarnations. With and we different made numbers. a record and right as the record was, I mean, it took us a, what a year to, to make this record. And we're super proud of it called hands of time. And then right as we were about to release it, the three other members, they got a record deal with another project of theirs and, oh. and they just took off and yeah. it was like, okay, well, what do we do now? And we never really, you know, got it back together, but we, what ended up happening, the great blessing out of that as when things are falling apart, they're actually coming together is Dylan and I start playing together as a duo. And yeah. We started realizing, okay, we like, the this harmony thing that we have together is something that we need to kind of explore more and develop and but also we met rich reese who is our like best friend and booking agent right now through the band the janks and stuff because he came and saw saw us play or you guys play i wasn't even in the band when he saw you first yeah and he yeah rich has always been a friend and believed in in us and just tried to make something work and he managed that band for a little bit and once it ended we we got back in touch and that's when we we were thinking yeah but there were there were several times that the janks the original band that that we had that we were like oh here's an opportunity oh we're recording in this amazing space with this uh, this person and this could be like this is our shot this is it nope it didn't work or then the next time it would happen like different things would happen and we went through like three or four moments of that that were like something's just not right. Like something's not working, like clicking for us. And what's amazing is that the, it worked when we actually decided let's do it ourselves. Oh yeah. Let's just do it ourselves. And, um, yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. 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 Sometimes you have to clean house. Yeah. Yeah. Go back to what the real foundation of everything really is. And I think accepting I guess like our goal in life is to accept as much responsibility as we can. Like, you know, the so taking it on ourselves and saying, you know, we're going to do it. We'll take it, take it on. There's something empowering about that and also scary about it, but it's. Well, cause it will admit the more you try and carry the stronger your back gets. Yeah. You know, that's the idea is that. Yeah, it's been a great learning experience just traveling around the country for these last four years. It's well, just. But the, the band did fall apart. Yeah. <laughs> which one <laughs> which one janks <laughs> oh yeah but what yeah. well, we did end it like it was yeah, very we, specific because yeah. we had a, a one last so what about those other guys that moved on and did their project the one um they're those no guys the, are doing but good. they made a great record it was yeah. a great record and uh but yeah they're all doing their own things now but that that project didn't work out yeah but that's just how things are and it's interesting at the time um these are all huge life lessons just in terms of relationships is that it's like if I could go back, I would have been so much uh, more graceful in terms of just like, yeah, we don't have to do this. Go, go for it. You know, I was so, I held on to it so much. Yeah. And uh, that's an important that experience helped. that I think we went through that informed our attitude towards what we're doing now, which I mean, all experience, you know, is good for what you do, but you, you have to take that to every, for everything you do. But I don't really believe in having a democratic band. 
I, d- yeah. I just don't think that it, it, it unless you're doing these little sp- short projects and you're not fully committing you're just or we're just doing this one project everyone knows their role and it's cool but for for, for as a life choice of our own project like it's clear that we just need to be as a as a duo and maybe working with one other person like working with Burley which yeah. has been great for this project but of course as the Zmed brothers that's just us yeah the, and and it should be that way you know we should always we're we're the ones that should be accountable to each other and not relying on other people to do anything for us um well but yeah, yeah. i guess I mean, we haven't really explained who burley is you, you just mentioned burley oh i guess i yeah sure is that okay to exp- oh yeah go ahead yeah Bur- well burley is our uh we met him through rich through rich and uh, he's he's the captain of the ship, really. I mean, he's he's our tour manager, and he's the drummer. And we started the project with him. We're co- co-founders of the project of the Everly Brothers Experience show, and um, yeah, we've just been organically developing everything with him from from you know day one. Um, and yes, he comes from a great family. They're all really good people. His his father is the founding member of Ambrosia, and he's a yeah. brilliant drummer. And, and his mom is was the uh, pianist and vocal arranger for Jimmy Buffett for years. And, wow, um, super talented. Very, so he grew up in that positive. lifestyle yeah. too, of just like family's gone or like they're out here, and he's got a you know that. Whole so you guys could probably relate in big some time. degree right away. Yeah. Big time, yeah, yeah. And he's it, it's, it's and it's been working. It's it's nice sometimes to have a buffer between yeah. us too. Oh yeah, there's been many times where he's protected us from getting at each other's throats you know yeah <laughs> yeah so well yeah it's it's good to have that third because when it's just two people it's either one person's right or the other person's right so you know having a third person in there you know it really helps kind of figure out problems right mm-hmm. if something comes up someone's yeah. gotta you know someone's yep. gotta give somewhere so the third person is you see that yeah person who, and we've we've always felt like burly is like probably in high school was voted most likely to be a cruise director or yeah. something like that. <laughs> he's just got the best, he's got the best personality and like such a bubbly, bright spirit and like yeah. just positive attitude. Yeah. You imagine that you'll turn on the TV in your little cabin and he'll be on one of those exercise bikes yeah. You know, yeah. telling everyone what the events <laughs> well, are for yeah, the day. At like seven in the morning. <laughs> but, well, that's cool. But, so, yeah. so basically the project, um, when you met, Burley, did you have the project in mind before you met him or something you guys met? Well, yeah, it was Rich's mother. Uh, so r- once again, r- Rich is, I mean, not only has he become our, our booking agent, but he was a friend for years and his mother is favorite. Her favorite artist is the Everly's. And so we sang a couple songs for her and she said, you know, you guys sound pretty good doing that. Maybe you should really think about doing more of it. And it, and it always, it planted the seed, but we never, we were, we were still on this, the, we were doing the original music so full throttle yeah. and we had a lot of momentum. We were, we were doing well in, in Los Angeles. We, we built it back up after those members left. We built it back up. And- yeah. For, for some time we, um, the guy who recorded like the big album that we did with the Janks, um, his his name is Paul Kilmeister and it's Lemmy from Motorhead Son. Yeah. And so he was playing bass in our band for like three two and a half years yeah. or so. So it was a we was a four piece band, just I was on electric mandolin playing through an amp and pedals. Yeah. <laughs> it was ridiculous. And I was playing a strat, you know, just yeah. and, and and we singing. had drums and and it was it was so much fun. It was just a show a live show of just energy. Like that's what we were all kind yeah, of. Yeah, like A C D C we were just like loving that kind of yeah. vibe where it's all just sweaty and everything but i don't want to get off track though yeah but so yeah you're saying that the mary rich's mom and that kind of planted the seed so that was the and- first seed then just over time we we were doing this original band and doing all the different clubs around town and also at the same time playing as a duo and we we noticed most of the time with the band we would get an evening at a venue and they'd at a or at a, a bar or pub, and you'd get three hundred bucks for the night, and you'd have to curate the evening, yeah. and you'd get some drink tickets. And we started by booking two other bands, so we'd give a hundred bucks to each band. That's not, you know, that's not a living. And then 
So we thought, well, why don't we just fill the night just as our band? But even then, we've got four people, 300 bucks. That's not that much money. Yeah. So we just started playing shows as, as a duo and making a little bit more money, making more tips. And also, it was sustainable because we were singing softly and not blowing our voices yeah. out. And we had our own little PA system and we could travel easily to get to this gig and then do that gig. And like, so we were working like three, four times a night or a week. Um, uh, sometimes we did have two, two gigs shows in a, a night, night. Yeah. And we'd travel across town to do that. And that was, that was fun because it was just us yeah. and people could hear everything we were doing. We could easily switch songs around and, um, and we were getting paid more and, and it was easier on our voices and we started thinking our buddy our buddy Tyson Kelly super talented um he he had a band called King Washington that we always used to play with Tyson had taken off and been doing all these John Lennon gigs and we couldn't believe that he was making a living doing this this stuff and so once we had 10 Everly songs down we just started noticing this naturally fits our voices well yeah that was the biggest thing yeah. is we got to fill these three hours of, of music and yeah, we have some originals and we know a couple covers, but let, let's learn more stuff. And like, yeah. what do we want to learn that really we are in love with and that features our, who we are really like that we have this brother harmony and that we can play these, you know, country kind of bluegrass rock and roll blues stuff. And, and it really, it led us, the path led us to the Everly songs and that's, yeah, we learned like about 10 of them and, we're playing them and people would just kind of react to them differently than the other songs we were playing. And it was, yeah, I mean that, that kind of, it evolved from there. Right. Yeah. It's just, I remember the first time we even played once we, we looked online to see if anyone was doing an Everly show that we liked or, and, or, or the way that we wanted it to, it to be done. Yeah. And we didn't see it. And when we put together a little promo video and sent it to Rich, he got us our first gig within a week. And uh, in Vegas, yeah, at, like, a, and a, like the guarantee we've never gotten in our lives. Like, yeah. holy moly! Like, what is going on? So here? I remember in 2015, I, I was just, I, I went on a very long hike with two dear friends of mine, and I was blown away by the work that they were doing. Our friend Garth had started an, an autist, uh, a school for autistic kids, and, uh, and it was you know, where they were playing music and making film. And, and my other friend, Lillian, she was uh, rehabilitating people in prisons in Colorado. And I was just like, what am I doing? Like, I just, I just felt like everything I was doing was so self-serving, but playing this, um, my original music, it was just, it was all about me and yeah. my problems. And I just, I just said, I'm done with that. I can't do it. And the first show we played with this Everly Brothers Experience show, uh, at, at the um, it was the sun, um, the six, the sun, no, no, the what? the actual first booked show, the uh, Sun Coast Casino in, in oh. Las Vegas. It was uh, a five hundred seat room. It was sold out, and the moment we walked out together, and like the experience of that, we've never been in a show like that before and never felt that moment before and we both like we're, what is going on here this is something new and yeah, then we're... after the show the people coming up to us and saying i was like i was dancing like with my deceased husband you know during those songs like just you know they were imagining that experience just like whoa this is like there's something the 60 years of memories connected to this that's really so deep the, the 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 point in all that is that it needs to be the f the moment that we made it about something greater than ourselves was the moment that the universe said here go do yeah. this you know and it's so crazy how it happened within six months of me letting that other band go and being willing to uh, i was going to just let music go i was going to go maybe back to school and maybe i don't know go to psychology i, I wasn't positive yet but i was seriously considering just changing my life did you feel like it's time to grow up oh yeah i kept yeah. thinking about my parents and i was just ashamed that i didn't have a bed that they could sleep in yeah and that that was um yeah i mean that's part of what shifted it it's just i i have to i can't just do whatever i want like I, 
<laughs> I have to have discipline and do yeah, something for other people. It, it's a pretty common musician thing to go through, right? And I think everyone goes through that at a different time in their life. You know, some people, or it's not until they get to their 70. Sometimes it's during 25 where it's like you're playing, you're having fun, you enjoy what you're doing, but then sometimes you realize, I have to make a living. Or 20 years from now, what's going to happen? Or you see people around you that have, you know, what looks like solid jobs and you think, well, they're going to have a retirement package waiting for them and and all those things. And you look at that and then you, you realize, well, what am I, what am I doing, right? Even though lots of times we all know this, we look at other people and we always think the grass is greener on the other side. <laughs> and, you know, a week later they get dropped from their job and things go bad and then and then you've still got this thing you can do anywhere i mean you can just pick up and go anywhere and sing and play and and do what you're doing yeah there's you, something you, universal about it yeah you can yeah. make it you can make something work somewhere mm-hmm. always um and you can't always on and every job um but yeah i know it i know it, what you mean there's a there's a kind of a pivot where you 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 come to where you realize you have to you either have to take the next step and get really serious about what you're actually doing or else okay i've i've you know i've got to get something that i feel yeah that when i wake up in the morning and there, and got the bills to pay that that you know i'm going to feel good about where i'm going to be in 10 20 years from now oh, yeah yeah, yeah um, i think i think for us that there was a specific gig that we did that really kind of shifted our headspace in the way you're talking about it was um we have these buddies in this group called the deltas they're brothers as well john and ted siegel and uh they there's this place called the old place in uh, malibu um california it might and even technically be a gore hills but, gore yeah. hills yeah um but it's this restaurant where there's three seatings each night at like a 5 30 a 6 30 and a 8 30 or something like that and um, you, whenever everyone orders the tables order, you go around to each table and you, you're basically busking. You're, you're asking them like, is there any, Hey, we're, we're this med brothers. Is there any song you'd like to hear? We could play for you. And you kind of work them until you find like, Oh, maybe you'll like this one. And then you play them a song or two. And which is the complete opposite of every gig we've ever played where, where you're in the corner and people are just subject to whatever you're playing. Yeah. yeah so I, they had chose the set list and you had to go to them as opposed to they come to you at the, so the show. So we learned our little 30 second pitch like like who we are, you know, why we're here, what we specialize in, can we play something that you like? And yeah, and then we'd just have to learn new things because people would keep requesting this or that. And then we're like, oh, we got to learn this song. And yeah. but just putting ourselves out there in that way shifted our headspace about like, what well, we got to represent ourselves and like we got to take initiative on what we do more so than like just showing up to a theater and just, you know. So there was that. That was a, I think a, a really a pivotal kind of experience, at least for me, confidence-wise and getting to know myself and how to be. A, a well, and also to keep, uh, to be in the song, but, but mindful of what was going on around us because they were they were taking food everywhere, and you'd you'd have to. I mean, sometimes I'd be you know. Lifting your holding yeah. the guitar up, just trying to let people get by, and you don't want to hit anybody, and and but in the middle of the song, which was great training. Yeah. Yeah. And just to have a good attitude during all that, like, yeah, that, that's, that's, that is work. <laughs> Having a g- good attitude yeah. is, is a, goes a long way. Yeah. And yeah, you know, we've probably all worked with, I think musicians are, are, can be all over the place with that too. You know, we've worked with a lot of people probably too, where you've all seen, well, does that person fit in the band or do they have the right attitude for that? And, and, I think the people who end up doing well or moving on well are those people who make those pivots or figure it out at some point that what do I need to do to change myself or do something different to get myself further ahead. Mm-hmm. And and then actually you, you start thinking it as the music business, right? Mm-hmm. There's a, 
it is the music business and there's there's a certain time you get to where you realize there is a business part to it and we're doing music now now let's do music and business and they're two completely different things that that you know you need both of those to to really make it yeah to make it work you see so many people who are like insanely talented and you just but they don't have that other side of themselves where they they go out to you know sell themselves or or they just or they don't have the 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 lane that they can that they really just stick to this thing yeah you don't need to do everything just do that thing and let people get to know you doing that thing Mm -hmm. or there's certain things that they keep themselves from being able to grow to the next level because of certain i don't know just uh certain insecurities yeah all those things uh, because some of those guys are so uber talented. I mean, they've got that part of the brain that just kind of fires on all cylinders, and but they can't really land that great gig or yeah, um, never hold that good gig because you know there's something we're like, you know, I always say there's there's always a, someone could be really great at something, but there's something in the opposite side, you know, yeah, the, the yin to the yang. So what's that <laughs> other part, you know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's gonna creep up. Can we deal with that? And the more it seems to me, the more talented they are. The weirder the sure the, the extreme is. It's hard yeah, to universe. find people that are. Um, <laughs> I, I, I just thought of uh, Derek Smalls from Spinal Tap, where he says he's lukewarm water. Yeah, you know, <laughs> but, but but like finding the the people that are just um that that are really talented, but just know where to sit in the mix. Yeah, and that's that's the hard thing to find. Everyone kind of. And then there are other people on the other side of the spectrum who are like incredibly savvy business people and just super amazing personalities that might not be like that, you know, you you know, on the... Oh, like a brilliant talent or something like that. Yeah. Or, I mean, not to... Musical talent. Yeah. Yeah. In that regard, but... Yeah. So when you kind of came up with the idea of the show and you did that first show in Las Vegas, it seems like you really realized even right from the that first one yeah before year. we were playing to like 20 year old punks who were just getting drunk and wanting to you know make it with a lady that night or something like that like we we that's was the group of people we were i mean not to knock that that's a wonderful thing go for it but the <laughs> <laughs> the whole point is that the the energy of the crowd the intention of the crowd and the age group as well like was all different and it was such a meaningful... I mean, the other was so meaningful, too, because it was... I mean, both our spiritual experiences getting to be on a stage and to perform, but the this com- one just had... There was something, a, you know, more sustainable about it and more just deeper, meaningful that, that I think really resonated with us. And like, Well, just... I remember that first gig that we we modeled the show after their reunion show because... I mean, they already did. It was like they put together a perfect retrospective of their material. And the way that they came out was from opposite sides of the stage with the spotlights. And so we, if if we're able, you know, at theaters, we come from the opposite sides and yeah. meet in the center and give each other a hug. And so we decided we were going to do that the first show. And I remember walking out and I got, I, I'd never felt that way before because um, I got chills right away. Um because it was connected to other people and their memories and yeah. the respect that they have for this stuff. I just, I did, I didn't realize how emotional a show it was going to be until yeah. we met the people. And yeah. and it's a become and sustained being a super therapeutic experience because it's about, it's the show is about brothers harmonizing and um, you know, literally but also like there's a certain amount of emotional harmony that we have to have to be able to do the show and we've worked through a lot of things together be having to honor this project and it's really like been a huge educational experience for us too i think because you know like well, you know i mean the whole idea of of a a, a marriage is that the two people aren't able to um, cut and run Like you have to be accountable and I don't want to equate, you know, our brotherly relationship to a marriage, but there's, but there's, there are uh, a lot of, (laughs) but there are a lot of similarities in the fact that we're honoring something bigger than us. So all of the 
crap that we have in between us each day has to be dealt with in order to put on a good show. That's a, at least, and I feel like that's kept us, that's yeah. kept us on track. I think. Well, that's I think coming from a, a family band and family business, we go through the same things too. I mean, I think any family business or any family oriented work environment, they have to do that. But what's the cool thing is, is when you hit the stage that you realize that you got to put that stuff aside and you're here for the audience. And usually that can only happen in a family circumstance. If you had your buddy who's been performing with for years and you're going to hit that stage and you're going to still be mad that whole time. Mm -hmm. Uh, And you see, you know, some big groups go through some pretty big breakups and they could say they're like family, but they're not family, right? Mm -hmm. So the show actually is the part that brings you back together again, right? It's Mm -hmm. sort of like it works. It's like going to a therapist almost. like it's, And the the audience being there and, you know, I think being accountable to the audience and like not to put upon them all these heavy emotions or whatever your problems are, but to to be accountable to the spirit of why you're there and yeah. what the what's important about the experience of it. That what's a, that makes you elevate your your being, I guess, or like put those things aside to kind of like we have to be accountable to these people here. And that that's a huge thing for us to have to go through every night because, you know, that's that's what I feel like is a big reason why it forces us to Yeah, and I I noticed that ever since ever since we've we kind of stumbled into into that idea that we have to be honoring something greater than us. It can, we can't just be doing this for us. And somehow that keeps us in check that I don't want to do anything after this project that isn't for some someone else, I, I, yeah. if that makes any sense. Well, yeah, it changes the way you look at everything and you're doing it right. You know, it's it's not it's not something you're just throwing together i think people could leave saying those guys could have been the everly brothers right even though you you're, you're doing your thing and you're paying tribute to everly brothers there's still a part of you that kind of kind of thinks well if this was back then this could have been the everly brothers right Aww. which is a another cool element and part of you guys being brothers and and having that that bond that really works you know if it was just two singers I don't think you'd get that same thing, right? Yeah, there's in in the all the learning we've been doing about the their career, their life, their their story, and everything. Um, one of the significant areas um, that we don't we used to talk a lot more about in the show, but we kind of tapered off is um, Shenandoah, Iowa, where they spent like their most formative years, and like that's where they first sang professionally on KMA radio and all that, and. Um, but what's interesting is that at such a young age, they were like professionally singing and uh, doing harmony. And there's, it's almost like a second language. Wasn't it Monday through they were, they were every day uh, they were on KMA radio or KFNF radio before school. Yeah. Uh Every day of the week. And then Uh, a Saturday, like daytime performance, I think as well. And that, that kind of discipline at such a young age it was like a second language singing harmonizing to yeah. them so the the certain intuitions they had about each other and just that 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 smooth or the you know involuntary aspect of their singing was on yeah, another level the way level, that phil described harmonizing with uh, don which is weird to me cuz when i hear the everly brothers i don't hear a lead i just hear yeah I'm like wow they're both lead singers that's crazy and, and uh, but the way that Phil thought of it was that he was following Don, and but he didn't ever think in notes. He just thought in shapes and uh, like water yeah. going along, like uh, you know the the land of the you know how water just sits on land and follows the land. You know, yeah. His voice was the water on on Don's like voice being the land kind of thing. That was kind of how he described it. But yeah, yeah I mean, just that they're the, how young they were when they were. St- singing and just that they were being trained by their father who's and mother who 
were you know in the professional music industry and and the Bales brothers were the primary duo that I think that they listened to. Phil was saying that, that you know more so than the Leuvens or or the Blue Sky Boys, um, but uh, it's interesting that they came from this country tradition, but they they hated wearing the country garb. I oh, mean, yeah. the, I mean, all of their peers and everything, they were embarrassed wearing it. And yeah, yeah in high school, they were doing the ducktails with their hair just because that's what they wanted to do. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, but and Don was super into Bo Diddley and. Yeah, so it's yeah. it's just interesting that they have they, that they have an old sound to them because they were raised by their by Ike and, and Margaret and they they instilled that in them. But they were forward thinking, um, and they were also very different. I think from what I read, Don was more shy but very like artistic and like to cook and and paint, and and Phil was more uh, gregarious and and um athletic uh, and he and don liked the rockers more phil liked the ballads more yeah um yeah but yeah that just kind of the we've spent a good amount of time in shenandoah iowa and um have gotten to know like uh some wonderful people there and we've we kind of started doing this annual thing now uh called heritage or everly heritage day and uh Founded by founded by Sherry and Cheryl Davis and and yeah. uh, and Bill Hillman and it's but it's just a uh, it's just a, it's a wonderful town and the history there is so cool. It's and, where Bill Monroe uh, left left his brother to go and f- start a band. So he ha- at that was the moment where he actually started playing solo mandolin. And so it's just weird that that there's this history there that people don't know about. And and they were the goal in Shenandoah was for it to be this kind of like Nashville of the I don't know of the Midwest or something like that, but it just yeah. never happened. And the main highway it changed, so it directed traffic somewhere else. And it's amazing traveling around the country and just you see how these towns some get just kind of get left left behind. So we're trying to help in any way we can going back there every year and. It, well, it's helping us, I think, yeah. more than we're helping them because oh. it's just so cool being oh, there. Oh, of course, <laughs> yeah. of course. It's just amazing yeah. just getting to marinate in the spirit there and just get to know the history and, you know, because it was so, so influential on their career because they they attribute that town to what kept their heads on their shoulders and feet on the ground throughout their career. and Yeah, they were just um, like hardworking Midwestern kids and, and folks. Uh, it's, you get that... But yeah, stories like that, I mean, experiences like that, that we're getting to have, I think that's just like, it puts the wind in our sails. Like, it's yeah. just so, because it's direct. It's a direct, like, almost being historians or studying the, the where it comes from and, and why it is yeah, what it is. Yeah, we actually, set, we during the, whatever that polar vortex was in at the end of January and, f- and early February before the winter dance party, we went and recorded a bunch of the songs off of songs their daddy taught us in their house, in the childhood home. Oh, that's and that, I mean, which it, that should be a, the record that we're selling at the show. Seriously. <laughs> seriously. Cause it just, it, it was so meaningful to spend. We spent nine hours in there and it was like 30 below outside. And, and, and it really felt like a home. It's literally just one room. Yeah. And, uh, but the spirit was there yeah. and those kinds of things we, we carry with us as we're traveling around the country. The, the other ones would be there would be, I would say meeting, um, Phil's, uh, Phil's widow, uh, and Don's daughter and, and, and her kids, I think nine shows in to this project, we ended up, I mean, it, it was, was so soon. new. Oh, it was, yeah, and <laughs> it was way too soon. And, but it was, it was terrifying and, and just made us want to take it. Even it was on more Father's seriously. Day. It's right. That's right. It was Father's Day of 2016. So that in means two at the di- city winery and two years after Phil passed. And yeah. the, it was Phil's widow and, 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 being there to come see us on that day was just like kind of oh my goodness yeah, it like, scared us it really yeah, kind of like know. kicked us in the butt with like okay we we gotta really like every time we get on this stage we we have to like it's got to be as if we're playing to the family if we're playing to 
Yeah. You know, because we, we, yeah, that's just the way it has to be. But they gave but, us their blessing, and that was a big deal. Uh, and then the next big thing was our... Um, a friend from Los Angeles, a songwriter named Bill, Billy Steinberg, he co-wrote a lot of songs with uh, Tom Kelly. They wrote uh, Like a Virgin and uh, I Touch Myself and uh, uh, True Colors. They're just yeah. they're brilliant songwriters. But their favorite artist was the Everly Brothers. And I, I even found online, like Cindy Lauper said that whenever she would call Tom and Billy, their answering machine was them singing All I Have to Do is Dream in Harmony. Oh, yeah. But... Uh, we told we would back Billy up on a lot of songs uh, or uh, any events that he was doing, and he became kind of a mentor. And he was friends with Dell Bryant, uh, Felice and Budlow's son. Felice and Budlow wrote all the songs for for Donna Phil, so many songs for them. And he got us in touch with Dell, and we told Dell we were c- coming to the Franklin Theater and and in Tennessee. And he came, he came with his, with his wife and daughter, or sorry, his wife and son, Thaddeus. Um, and there just have become such, that was a huge affirmation just because they were so kind and wanted to help in any way that they could and, and invited us to their home. I think it's a big yeah. reason why we've like fell in love with Tennessee is just the spirit of people out there. Like, in LA, we kind of experience a lot of people when they have success, they kind of hoard it, and yeah. they they. But whereas in like Tennessee, we just felt this like, if I share, then the water rises and we all rise with it, you know together, kind of a spirit and all that. So that was a. So here's a weird connection for you. So I'm not sure if you remember or not because you you got a lot of venues. Remember that guy being your monitor guy in Franklin? What? Yeah, of course yeah. I do. He's a good friend of mine. What? No way. Yeah. So Martin Fry, he and he's episode twenty eight. That's of, awesome. Of this podcast. <laughs> That's yeah. So no, cool. I remember that. I mean, he he's was there. Those guys that were show. so nice. Yeah. yeah. He's an exceptional audio guy, and uh, he's from around Toronto. Uh, so we we knew of each other, and that's and, crazy. I remember yeah. talking to him about that. I remember him saying that he moved down there. Like what, how long ago did he move? It wasn't a while ago, right? It's a while now. Yeah. That's so yeah. cool. What a trip. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, <laughs> cause I know he, on a couple, uh, posts on Facebook, he's commented, uh, how great you guys were. Oh, oh that's uh, so goodness. nice. Yeah. But that, that was the, that was the kind of the, the big thing is that there were just certain families that, that, in Tennessee that kind of just took us, took us under their wing or, or just were so supportive and the blocks and it's, yeah, the Sandra and Ron block are their angels. They're, they're in, incredible people. Ron block is, um, he's, he plays banjo and he also plays guitar in union station. Oh, nice. uh, and, uh, and that is, yeah. they're just so, they're so c- yeah. cool. They're the best people and they're family. They really are. And they were, Th- them and Dell Bryant were the two fa- families. The Bryants were the two families that that said, "You guys need to move here. You guys are supposed to be here." And you know, I, I, so all I want to do now that we have a place there is the first two things are a record to to gift to them, just because I I don't know I just feel so yeah grateful. Well, it's pretty neat that you guys feel so connected. To the project, right, and it and it you, you, it feels like you it, it's really important that you do it right, um, and that's unlike most people who are doing shows like you're doing. Um, it doesn't, you know, there's not a real true connection. That's just a way to to keep things going, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, you know that's really super important, and I'm I'm sure that singing this music, um constantly really kind of makes you connected to them in a way you never thought you would be before too. Cause I mean, I think the music really is special in, in a certain way where it makes you connect to it, you know, unlike Bo Diddley and that's a fun song, but you don't feel like you're connected to it. You know, there's a lot of the Everly Brothers songs. You There's an innocence kind of captured yeah. in it and a certain type of time period that's, that's captured in it and all that. And that's yeah. definitely, the, I, 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 I understand the innocence part of it, but there's something else that I feel from the writing 
sometimes is, I don't know, there's something about songs like All I Have to Do is Dream that's, that seem, I don't know what the right word is, like dignified or n- noble. I don't know what, uh, there's something just so beautiful about those songs. They're like, ja- they're like brilliant jazz standards or something. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the way Phil kind of, acknowledge that yeah the the rockers were like they got us acknowledgement and stuff but it's the ballads that like made us timeless like that's kind of something he said in interviews and specifically like all i have to do is dream and let it be me those songs like they kind of make you an eternal a, a timeless group because of just how this the well, message songs and- like that i mean all i have to do is dream was cut i think it was in the top 10 f- Every decade, I think. Oh, yeah. Because who else did it? Jeannie C. Riley and and Glenn Campbell and Let It Be Me was this kind of the same thing. But it's that's the other thing is that the Everleys they were brilliant interpreters yeah. too, and and that's been a, a great learning experience. I mean, George Jones made incredible cover records. Uh, uh, Love Bug is an amazing record. Uh, so I just think about all the interpretation that you know that we can do of of old songs uh that we haven't heard before like we, i we haven't heard anyone do a um what's what's that hank lachlan song that you uh, good woman's love yeah like I, I just song. there's just certain songs i would l- love to record in a i know that this is a little bit more of uh, of a tangent but it seems like so many acts even original acts now you could almost call them tribute acts because they're they're yeah. paying homage to a certain style, even Everybody though it is. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's yeah. I, so. Just because they're not exact covers, you're just kind of writing songs that are like another act or like another time period. It's yeah, with so with, many notes. Yeah, yeah with yeah. subtle <laughs> permutations or yeah. different li- lines or vo- vocal lines and stuff. But yeah, so you guys are pretty heavily on the road now. How how do you guys kind of find yourself now as? Being steady on the road, do you, and do you find yourself kind of getting to an age where it's like, do you feel like you've miss having a family, or I'm, you know, I'm sure you get, you know, I I get asked that question all the time, yeah. um, but yeah, I'm sure it's something that that pops up. Indeed. Um, the one thing I was thinking though, the th- the thing that is nice is that when you're touring, you are touring with family. Family. Yeah, right? mm-hmm. you're you've always got somebody there yeah. so it, it's not as if you're out on your own and i'm sure there's days that you want to be out on your own. Yes. <laughs> sure. yeah but yet you're always close to family right so you yeah. have that that thing so how do you deal with those feelings when you're you're touring a lot now yeah yeah i mean definitely the last three years we intentionally sacrificed a lot to be able to do what we're doing because we knew like we need to build this we need to put our spirits into this and um, we kind of equate it to, you know, like sailors going off at sea, they have a mission, they, they're in a small group of people, you know, isolated in this one thing, but they're just like doing their, you know, you start hallucinating mermaids. <laughs> <laughs> you do that too. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, or like soldiers off at war that they are out for a cause, you know, and, and just fighting the good fight. And, but, you know, and they sacrifice their social life at home and their, their loved ones, like being able to see them and develop relationships. And, um, but now that we've given ourselves to it for the last three years, we've established a, a, enough of ourselves that we feel like we can now start restructuring our tour schedule. Yeah. So in 2020, we're thinking of uh, doing more of a spring, summer, winter, fall tour or fall, winter tour. So, and where we go out for a month and really pack it and then have a month off or something like that. Yeah. So we can start tending to, uh, you know, relation like a love life or, um, and all that. And just now that we have a home too, that we like, we got it, we want to be there and we want to work on our records and, yeah. and all that. So the, our heads are shifting about that. But for the last three years, we definitely were like, let's just, we want to work. Just, yeah. just anything we can get, let's do it. Like we were road warriors, like... And it was crazy. We did some crazy stuff. For three years, we were, I think it was on the road for over 300 days each year, wow. like for three years. Yeah, not in one place yeah. for longer than a week yeah. the whole time. And like, you know, just last year we drove 80,000 miles with our tour van, um, you know, back and forth across the country, maybe six times or so, More seven times. Yeah. Then mm-hmm. we toured all of Ireland, like all around there. And, um, 
and just you know i mean you, you being a traveling musician you know that like doing the show is only a fraction of the amount of like yeah. energy that's spent doing all the other things and getting from a to b and just managing a group making sure everyone's happy with the things they have and like booking things and this and that so yeah it's 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 we've we've sacrificed a lot and um but for the best cause i could ever imagine like i feel so proud to be yeah, doing we're what trying we're doing. to get better at what we're doing too because i mean there's always just room for improvement and you, we <laughs> there's plenty i mean thankfully we, we're keeping it going but there's always stuff that we can improve upon and it's hard to it's hard to be able to do that if you don't take the time off yeah and th- and reflect and you just yeah, we've had yeah. long bouts of like travel where we like realize, well, we haven't processed a lot of things that have happened to us in the last month or two months, and like then we stop for like three, four days, and then we like all these things come up, you know. But yeah, it's it's just part of the part of the experience. Yeah, and it's neat sitting in a place like you are here with our place where you sit for two weeks. Yeah, it really helps with that that type of thing too because you're not worrying about packing up and then okay tomorrow we gotta get up early and drive you know mm-hmm. 500 miles to the next place and the set up and then whatever or you have just one day off where you just you just need some sleep or um it gives you a chance to kind of do your thing but yet have some time to reflect and, oh, and it's get been, things together it is it's been so great yeah being we, here too like i i i love it up here and um, and and I like being in smaller towns too. I yeah. mean, smaller cities rather. Um, so I think Woodstock is what like sixty or thousand yeah, or something like there, that. Yeah. That's great size. Like mm-hmm. I don't need to be, you know. So we took our little drive into Toronto, and you get your your dosage of that, and you're just uh, for me. I just want to get back to. So I can't wait to get back. <laughs> yeah. For things to be, but but in terms of just the gig, yeah, it's been so relaxed it's 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 awesome yeah and the the types of things you can focus your mind on when you don't have to, when you've eliminated the element of like oh pack up and travel to the next place and make sure this and that works and this the, the fact that those elements are eliminated we our minds have kind of like shifted on like oh we can play around with how we do the show a little better and it's it, that's a that's a wonderful experience and just I, to know that that like the other guys you know, we we always think about the other guys in the band. Like, we got to take care of them, and just knowing that they've got they've got their rooms, they've got their routines. We got them food. They can they can yeah. do it. <laughs> you know, because if we're you know when we're just go go go, it's just I don't know. Not not everyone like we have to remind everyone to take care of themselves sometimes, and and it's it is more difficult when we're in that truck driver mode, and and. You just don't know what you're going to get food wise and stuff. And it's just so nice to have a. Yeah, this is a dream you know, gig. It's yeah, it really is. Gig. It's and so it's cool. Nice. You guys have this set up. It's just fantastic. Well, and and on top of that, you guys, the fact that you guys have are a family band that it's and and we're family. So it just it's comforting to be around other siblings that yeah. and families that play together because it's like, oh, yeah. There's some they tacit it. understanding. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like you know what we're dealing with, you know. To some and I love it. And the and and it's inspiring to see uh to see you guys make it work. Uh, because that's that that's the whole thing. It's like for us it's it's like whenever we get something it, it's like if something goes wrong and we want to punish each other. Yeah. And 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 I like I constantly just I constantly think about Cain and Abel. I constantly th- I think about it all the time. I think about like the whole idea of okay, you didn't get what you wanted, so you're gonna spite God and you're gonna you're gonna you know make everything worse, everything. Or you can, or you can uh, r- r- without getting biblical, you can just be, um, it, it just you have to in those moments you have to just be good you have to let those things go and not 
try and throw it on the other person. Why are you looking at me right no, now? Well, <laughs> well, I'm just no, <laughs> I'm just saying. It. He's looking at you to no, look yeah, at me. He's, <laughs> no, he's giving me a really I'm those talk- crazy peepers right I'm now. I'm talking about myself though. I know, I know. I know. I'm, I, but I'm thinking about myself. I'm thinking about those times when I, I I know I can recognize it in myself where you you might do something that's wrong and and it's like oh I could use that as leverage against yeah. you. You lose by me using that as leverage against you. Uh, and I lose as me, uh, but no one's winning by me, like putting you down. Like we both have to build each other up yeah. for this to work mm-hmm. and that can happen in any relationship. So I, it's been good for me to, to go through those moments and to stop myself and be like, what am, what am I gaining by putting you down? Nothing. I'm really not. Mm-hmm. We're both losing. Yeah, so. indeed. There's a fine line between acknowledging our shortcomings and then yeah putting each other down for our shortcomings yeah, yeah. that's the well there's thing. it's interesting because i can see um i mean obviously you make it look easy on stage but you can i can see past that and see the amount of work you guys have done to make what you got work because we do the same thing here you know we you work really hard to make it look easy mm-hmm. and make it just comfortable for you know for people to come in there's nothing to worry about that everything's looked after we get that comment all the time you guys are so organized and i've made that comment for a while i don't know how else to to do what we're doing i don't know just getting people up for the meal i was like i don't know how else you would do that you know there's there's not for me i look at it it's like well there's one proper way to do it i guess you could not pay attention and just let people sporadically do whatever they want and not care um I, i guess that's part of it it's just you you care right and 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 you can tell with your performance you care about what the audience is going to experience you know every single time and it's the same for us here it's like we you know we really care about um every aspect of from the moment someone arrives at the end of the lane to the moment they leave you don't want anything in between there to not be right so yeah, i mean yeah. there's only so much you can control you can only make so many people so happy but you try your hardest to kind of make it as good as you as you possibly can yeah, and i absolutely. think that's in the long run how you have longevity and and how you succeed and 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 it's the same with with you guys you know you you can tell you put you put the work and you put the thought and i can see you this week changing things up in the show and trying new things and you know, i think people can come complacent it's like well here's the show you know yeah we've done it a million it's fine but there's always uh seeing how people react to this moment or that moment yeah there's always little things you can do to yeah to change and and it's funny because the changes sometimes i think some people can get so locked into the show that the changes they make are so insignificant that it's like what we're talking about earlier is is mixing a song you know you get those make those little tiny little changes that nobody knows but you're so so focused in on it but you can you know you want to make the right changes that people actually notice Mm -hmm. um and not getting too deep into it but making those things that maybe it works good for you and and it also works good for the audience as well yeah keeping it fresh to some degree too i i mean i i feel like the some of the jokes that we've fallen upon, I know we do, we'll do like the same jokes, you know, every night or something like that. But it, the function that they have is, is more important than just like making a little joke. It's like, I feel like it kind of allows people to open up to us a little more. So there, there's a, there's a specific, like a very important mechanism that they, it serves, I think for the spirit of the show to kind of, you know, to, yes, it's like, we're presenting all this information, but also we're just like, we're being silly and we're like not taking ourselves too seriously as well. But I was, I think even though, you know, it's the same jokes every time it's, it's good to, they're an important role. I think they take in the show to kind of open people up a bit, but yeah. yeah. And we're always trying to search for present them in different ways or yeah. something just to keep it interesting. Yeah, because you know, I feel I feel so weird sometimes saying the same thing. I'm like, darn, I'm running that script, and I don't I don't like that feeling. Yeah, yeah. well, yeah, it's hard because in your head you know it so well, but for people hearing it the first time, um, it's all super new. You know, like yeah, seeing your show for the first time last week, it was like it felt like I, was, I felt very riveted and listened to everything you were saying. 
but it's our when you're doing it over and over again yeah to yeah think that's how it goes of how is you know how is people receiving this for the first time you which know? that's the way that's why i remind myself like these jokes have a very specific function so there's something powerful about like landing them well or doing our best to, to make them work in some way but yeah i mean it's always it comes from the show itself the songs list because we do, you know dig into the history of the song and then we find out oh it was written by this person oh how how can we play with that intro or something like yeah. that so it's like the the story that we're presenting we kind of dictates where little moments yeah. can ha- happen and stuff but. the story we don't really like doing a song if it doesn't have a story or at least some can connect connecting point yeah or it's part of the narrative yeah. of the show like it yeah. fits in that time period because that they did that song then and and it's you know it was a hit or you know there's a lot of different angles at which it, it's a significant thing to play but but those those are shows where things are kind of riding the line and it's and it's kind of uncomfortable at times yeah those are sometimes the most f- exciting that's oh, yeah. just because it's like wow we stumbled on something new there and the endorphins are going, and even though it's all new to the audience, well, in those rare cases, it's actually kind of new for us. But uh, I know that's not that's but not normally how it goes. We're, we're lucky to have such amazing songs to fall back on. If oh, seriously! If we hear crickets, oh my gosh, yeah, so many crickets. <laughs> I, oh my goodness. I have a bad habit of riding the line all the time, and, uh, <laughs> especially on stage. So it's like I can always get that look. I can look over because you know, I'm sure you you both know each other so well there's just gonna be just the slightest movement of an eye or something that you know it's like uh oh yeah yeah <laughs> but uh i think you know songs you you know not where to cross it but I, yeah I, I kiss the edge of that so <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> but, but that's so funny. great it's exciting mm-hmm. yeah know? it's like someone taking a it's like someone taking a, a, a or i'm trying to a solo or something that that is just rehearsed versus improvised and yeah. and the impromptus just feel so good they feel fluid and uh, i don't know everyone's different some people really want to be completely prepared some people do very well when they're kind of thrown you know thrown into the deep end yeah uh, and i i, know, I noticed that a lot of the time dylan will do well if i ask the right question if I, if there's some if we want to find something new in a in a bit i'll I'll th- just throw a different question at him and every once in a while he'll hit it out of the park. You know, and sometimes yeah. I just ask the wrong question and but, it's um, a bad pitch. Well, I mean, it's on both of us, but that it's all secondary to the spirit of the show, the intention behind like what we're doing. And that's, um, you know, that's, what's great is that's, what's keeping us like our hearts in the right direction. Yeah. So we can kind of play around a bit, but there's always this underlying trajectory that's happening. I think that like, I think keeps things together, you know, no matter yeah. what's happening. Oh yeah. Every time that we have a new player come into the project, it's, I mean, just explaining the fact, simply just the, the fact that, okay, we need, there's an aesthetic, but there's a, um, there's a musical aesthetic. We need to have a, like a classic kind of guitar. It needs to be clean sound with tremolo reverb. Um, probably don't even need a drive like if yeah. for, for solos, like it, you, we shouldn't be playing that loud. Yeah. And the way that those old solos were done were just to be using the volume a little bit or something like that. Yeah. Uh, and also just the fact that a lot of the, I mean, the Nash, the, the Nashville eight team, all the, the backup musicians playing with Donna Phil were, um, they were jazz guys. They were Western swing guys and they could play, they could, you know, they could play whatever they wanted to some, to some extent. And so the Western swing approach has been something I always talk about. Like just, um, there should be that little element of like, what's going to happen. You yeah. Know? Cause you listen to other takes of songs, by by uh by the Everleys or even from that time George Jones or Buck Owens and Don Rich and there are always little things that that change like they're they're such good players that there's a looseness to them to to it but it's still tight and uh, so the the jazz approach like bringing yeah. more of that in has been a, a big deal for me uh, yeah because Zach he the roles we kind of have in the show he's does all the musical directing and. uh so he'll chart everything and 
you know, if new members come in, he'll teach them the electric guitar part, teach them the bass parts. And, um, and then, so I kind of take care of the, all the promo, the art, art department stuff. And I put together the set lists and, and all that. And, um, Burley does the tour managing on the road, um, and all that. So we kind of have, we, we wear different hats. Like, you know, how you were saying with the family that, you know, who has their strengths and where they are and you kind of let those shine and, and all that. Yeah, we found a good, yeah. So, what are you guys uh, looking ahead? Do you you guys think five, ten years down the road at this point, or are you just kind of seeing where this goes? Well, I, I mean, definitely our our good friend Stephen Shore. He has uh, booked us several times, and he's always given us the advice: just like let it grow organically. Yeah, and I think we we carry that with us every moment. And I think something is so special about us having this opportunity to be kind of liaisons or purveyors of this part of history yeah. and this music that like, as long as there are people who want to experience it, like we have this show and we want to be giving it to people. We want to be celebrating it with people. So like I can imagine doing it in some form or fashion for as long as there's a desire for it. Cause it means that much to me. Cause it's like part of our childhood because we were raised on it and, it's such an amazing experience for us to grow through it and learn through it. And it's been such a gateway to such a, like a massive world of, of new music. And, uh, so like, I, th- I think that there'll never be a time where this isn't something super pivotal and flu- and important to us. So we'll be doing it for a while, but in what way and how consistent, you know, that might change. Like we yeah. may do like a tour every year of it and then have other shows or as time goes, but yeah wait and see yep. yeah yeah uh, i we definitely want to go deeper into uh specifically the zmed brothers and what w- other things that we can do i mean we're so lucky to have this show um but we want to build other shows yeah and like we were talking earlier uh, but you never know what catches on and what doesn't you know yeah so like you know we've got a good thing going and you know we just want to keep honoring it so yeah, it's great. But yeah, it's a good like safety for, I mean, I don't want to say safety, but it's just a... Well, because I mean, you never know, but I mean, that's why we, we wanted to work so hard is that we just, we wanted to, we want to be the guys. We want to be those guys that were, wherever it is in, in North America, people go, oh, well, we want an Everly show. Well, those are the guys that you got to get then. Yeah. Um, but, but there's just so much other music that we want to do and it's important for us to to put our own music out there too. So there's just tons of projects yeah, tons and of records that I want to make. And the way in which like us being reflecting on how this came to be, we want to do whatever we do next with that in mind. Like the the amount of heart that's involved in it that mount it's connected to our identity and all that and so it's all those things are, you know. Well, so the I mean an example would be so moving to Tennessee. So the first, you know, the first recordings that once I got everything set up, the first recordings that I wanted to make, even though I have a bunch of original material, I want to record. Uh, the first thing I wanted to do was something for, for the Bryants. And, uh, and I, it just feels right. I don't know. I don't know where it's going to take me. Yeah. But it, 2020 is a big year for the Bryants because there's the Ken, the Ken Burns documentary that's coming out with them as a uh, such a focal point, and then there's this nine month exhibit going into country the Country Music Hall of Fame that has you know the original ledger lines with you know all everything written on Wake Up Little Susie, All I Have to Do Is Dream, Rocky Top, and stuff, and and we're friends with Dell, and Dell even asked us to if we were around to uh play the um right next to owen bradley park there's the big the fountain there and they named that that fountain after felice and budelo this is in nashville this just happened a couple months ago so basically felice and budelo have become like the symbol of all of nashville songwriting yeah and we're and here we are close with their son and their son has all of these songs that were written for Donna Phil that didn't get recorded. Yeah. 
and and he's given us the and there's there's a couple that we want to do um, yeah and but i mean he's it's it's about honoring the legacy and and you know whatever is done is like it's got to be something done in a way that continues that you know that powerful legacy and not like you know anything to well that's why i just in the, with this record that i'm making we're making together i want to put a couple songs that his, his demos that we heard as his father do because he gave us these these songs to listen to and there's a few that sound like Everly Brothers songs that never got done oh yeah so yeah we've, we've looked and there's no artist that ever did it and it's like good man, so if we just rather than I just want to do it and yeah. then give it to him yeah and, and see, see what, what happens see what happens <laughs> should put one or two of those into the show yeah, yeah, It'd that's definitely neat. people yeah, as, really find that interesting yeah. too. That yeah, here's some new magical song that totally yeah yeah. I've been kind of leaning towards that with that that one specific song, like a statue. That that sh- it would be great to do that in the show. We will, Just, yeah, we will. So yeah. I was going to. I always like to ask, kind of uh, near the end of a podcast with with somebody. Uh, do you have any places that you've wanted to perform at that you haven't performed at yet the Ryman. Ryman. yeah both <laughs> together at the same time <laughs> and you guys got to do that that's so that's amazing the, yeah. yeah we were pretty lucky we got oh, to do our show there and wow that's the the coolest thing in the world it was funny because i was gonna say the chuck e cheese at first but then i thought no Ryman, Ryman. no I'm just woodland hills yeah i'm no, <laughs> no, sorry I'll go <laughs> well we we played the Ryman uh because i'm kind of the tech guy for the our show and stuff it was it was, you know, it was a busy afternoon and busy getting everything set up and, and kind of a lot of responsibility that way. So it was kind of rush, rush and doing this and doing this and you're in the Ryman and, you know, as Travis Tritt's monitor guy was our monitor guy and this other, you know, I, I brought our front of house guy, Ron came down and he was looking after things there and, you know, you hit the stage, we're into the second song and, and our steel guitar player and it was like, I was like, not really hearing a steel a whole lot and, and it was about third or fourth song and and we finally started to hear him and at the end of the show i found out that he basically was so thrilled about being on the stage and doing the show he just couldn't get in there and commit yet i mean he was just like it was almost like it was he was too emotional and i'm still in in tech land being you know the guy's making sure everything's sounding right and and it really for me it wasn't until about halfway through the show until i was able to kind of go holy smokes i'm playing at the ryman and th- part of that kind of bummed me out because i i didn't feel like i've i got the same experience that everybody else did because i was kind of worrying about all, the, all these other things but I, I got there which was <laughs> the main thing and it was like Oh, and then it was done. It was like, wow, okay. Now I got to pack up some gear and get over here. <laughs> yeah, back to tech mode. <laughs> yeah, but it was, you know, on the drive home, it you know, it was it's a bit of haul to get back home. It was that was the time I I feel like I really it really had a chance to reflect on what just happened. Yeah, it's um, a dream. Yeah, it was That's so cool. We had a a whole whack of people. We had I'm guessing maybe 15 coach loads of people came down to see us. That's amazing. Um, you know, so we had lots of support there and lots of fun. And But yeah, it's... Uh, Did it with your, and with your family. With the family too, yeah. That's yeah. just... That's yeah, and Mom and Kim were... They had, uh, they had Mini Pearl's dressing room. And, <laughs> um, so they were, you know... Kim used to do a Mini Pearl skit in our show years ago and was always a big fan. So that was, you know, that was huge. And uh, so yeah, it was, it, it's, it's pretty neat how there are certain places venues that's why i always ask the question because i'm always interested in finding out where's that place for someone that they if they haven't played yet where would yeah. that one place i mean the other places it? would for for me are they're not there i mean i would i would say the uh uh the palomino in, in north hollywood and the nashville nevada club in yeah. in vegas which are kind of they're gone um but those were just so important for country music and just kind of forgotten. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean the the 
the history that's connected to what we're doing and the fact that like for Don, I know, I mean, in all these interviews, you see him say that like, since he was a little kid, his dream was to play the Ryman. And, and in 57, when Bob by love came out, they were invited to play the Ryman they, or it, the grand old Opry, but that's what the Ryman is. It was the old, yeah, the original Opry, but yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, just the stories you hear about that place, and it's kind of the epicenter for so much uh, American music culture. Yeah, and just I'd say that's cool. the big one. I mean, uh, growing up, you know, obviously we in Los Angeles there was the Hollywood Bowl, and there yeah. was uh, the Gorge in Washington, and there's Red Rocks. Red Rocks. And yeah, it's a big one. Those are yeah. those are big deals. Yeah, and yeah. Very Staples cool. Center. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I wouldn't. <laughs> the other ones are, 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 yeah. Those, those, those other three are pretty cool. And well, you know what's yeah. crazy? We um, in uh, the Philippines. So the, I mean, we've in our show we talk about how the Everleys toured the world all the time, or for sixties and through in uh, all throughout the sixties they were touring. And they were huge. They in were the huge in the Philippines. And uh, our booking agent Rich is friends with someone in the Philippines who books. He's booked a lot of stuff there, and we were going to be doing like an arena show there like the a, timing wasn't right it just wasn't we'll right with the government happens, and stuff yeah. that like which is just crazy that like I, I, it's really good it didn't happen <laughs> but, <laughs> but but just yeah, we, it would we would have been playing an enormous venue yeah which they did when they were there the everly's were there like they played eight sold out shows to a sixteen thousand seat like arena yeah which is just that's insane that i mean it's just amazing that they had a global impact you know at such an early time you know but but yeah i can't imagine like for me it's more smaller little spots getting to play I, I, I just want to be a part of a, a community again of yeah. of musicians because we we did that in LA we were but but it'd be so nice to do it with this new this new vision that we have and this new spirit that we're coming at and and to represent something older in Nashville and playing around Nashville because even though there still is that spirit there there are, there are so many people that just moved there because because it's it's kind of like hollywood for for music yeah. now and and a lot of people have amnesia about the past and we really want to represent the past and bring it forward um for instance our friend we have a, a friend's band that we always used to to co-headline with in los angeles when we were playing as the janks we'd play with this band called the record company mm-hmm. and they've taken off they're doing awesome i'm so proud of them and what they do is really very much like it's old blues and the stooges kind of like put together and and in a way it's like a tribute to that music that they love and but with but with modern production and and a little bit more bass and you know little things like that to appeal to the sonic ears that people are accustomed to now and i would like to do that but with our what we want to do yeah. with our, um, yeah, but there yeah. are artists I love that are, that are now that are doing well, great work. A lot of people on compass records in Nashville, yeah. the, um, the, uh, cactus blossoms and the brothers brothers. Oh, I love the Malpas brothers. The Malpas mm-hmm. brothers. Yeah. They're awesome. Yeah. I know those guys. You yeah. do? Yeah. Oh yeah. They're, yeah. Yeah. they're incredible. That's so cool. Well, hey, well, what, I'm sorry. What is no. your, your show? What, what yeah. venue would you play on? Uh, that's a good question. Um, the usual, uh, Red Rocks is, yeah. is, I don't know why, I, but that's, that's right up there. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, the Hollywood Bowl, I think I, one of those things I think that I'd love to do it, but probably would be not as great as you think it is, you yeah. know, you know, when it's done, it's like, okay. Um, I like the venues that you're surprised at. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, those, for me, it's more now about the people you meet when you, and I, now I, I go back to a lot of venues over and over again. And so you get to know the people, the staff really well. So, you know, you can pick up the phone, Hey, you're coming in next, you know, whatever. And, hey, Darren's coming in there, you know, and it's, you, you get this kind of comfortable, 
um, situation where everybody's friends and everyone works hard to make the show, show the show yeah. is good. And, you know, there's always that sometimes in the new venues, that uncomfortable stage where, you know, I've, I've spent a long time trying to figure out how to break the ice when you come into a venue. Mm-hmm. And it's usually you got to come in and, hey, how's it going? Nice to meet you, man. A little bit of a joke. Break the ice. Try to find something that you can make fun of. And then immediately get to the point. And then it's like everyone's all of a sudden it's like, okay, all right, this is how the day is going to go. This is good. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then it's like, all right, let's get to work. Um, so I find that helps a lot. And I just want to have fun when I, you know, I won't, I'm, I'm pretty picky. Like I'm really detail oriented and, you know, really want stuff to go well. But I always know that everything that I know doesn't mean that anyone else is going to know. So I, I get that. But um, I always try to make sure everything I can be as good as it possibly can. You know, if there's a way to make something better, let's make it better. You know, even if so, if someone's coming to the show, everyone loves the show or something you're doing is working well. Is there still something else we can do to make it better yet? We, ha- we have to have uh, projects. Yeah. Like, I don't know what I'd do without, you know, seeing a, seeing a goal and moving towards it it gives uh, yeah. purpose yeah i mean that's yeah. the artist purpose you know it's it's i think uh yeah, yeah. i think you can't always think that you know it all or mm-hmm. you've figured everything out well, that's it's always, a bad place to be in yeah you gotta you always gotta feel that there's something more you can learn and and it's cool i think you get to a point too now where i feel that i want to be able to get back too. you know i think you get to a point where you you felt you've, you've put a lot of experience in you've learned a lot from what you've done, you're applying it and can I give something back to somebody that's not there yet? Or can you give some type of advice to whatever it could be? Um, and that feels good. Yeah. We've appreciated all the, the wonderful advice you've shared with us this throughout the, the residency. And we, yeah, that, we, thank you so much for, well, you guys don't need good much care advice. Us. Whoa, <laughs> no, come on. Any, but, I mean, everyone does, but it's, I think it's, for me, if, if, if you know that it can be well received and, and it's coming from a good place, I always think that uh, no matter what you're doing, you never know what it's like coming 100% from the other side, right? And I always feel that I wish someone would be gracious enough to say, you know, if they come see you perform, there's something you're doing that you're not doing right. Um, Or something that they think, hey, that would be really neat if you did this. And you've never thought about that. How cool is it to hear that? Because, you know, if you go to a restaurant and your your mashed potatoes aren't warm enough, you're going to hear about it. Yeah. (laughs) Right. You might think they are when they came off the plate. But it's the same thing when you're doing your job there, you know, in your mind, it might be running 110%, but there might be that something that you've never thought that someone Mm -hmm. else saw that you would never think of looking at or any of those things that it's, it's really cool. We we love getting to go after the shows. One of the greatest things, just getting to meet the crowd, you know, shake people's hands and just hear, you know, stories from them or that's from the get go. That was like, Oh, this, this really is like, direct feedback and people would say you didn't play this song or like can you and we'd hear that enough we're like okay there's something we gotta do that yeah yeah, it was like the peer review kind of thing or just to get that experience and it was pretty valuable and it always is it's every time you know just getting to see the people we just played to and looking at them in the eye and kind of connect to the emotion of why what we're doing and that's that's a special thing yeah, and it's just, it, you know, it's a neat, it's a small world, right? It, what we do, there's not that many people doing it. And it's neat when you can travel around the world and, you know, spend a bit of time with someone and then really consider them good friends, mm-hmm. right? That you could be somewhere five years later and pick up the phone. Hey, it's, you know, such and such from here. How you doing? Hey, I'm in your town. want to hang out. And I was like, absolutely, right? You know? <laughs> yeah. And that's, that's a, that doesn't happen everywhere. And it's, you know, it's certainly, um, it's been neat here because we're kind of at the stage where we've been doing it long enough that, you know, you get people who've crossed circles and, 
and uh, you know, I'll, I'll be calling different people or checking in, see if someone's available. And they're like, oh, yeah, we know about your place. Such and such played there and they told us about your place and whatever it is. And it's like, wow, that's, you know, you heard about us? You know, yeah. We're this little place up here in, in Canada, but you get to know the venues and it's neat to hear that someone else knows that you're out there. So, mm-hmm. um, and it's the same with, you know, you guys, it's, you know, it's, it's no different. It's, it's, it's neat to know how many people know that you're actually out doing what you're doing. Yeah. And, uh, um, you know, certainly I think I'm trying to remember how I, I got to, to find it. I think I was looking for an Everly Brothers show and you popped up right away on like on a Google search probably or something like that. You, you came up somewhere or I do a lot of searching what other venues are bringing in. And I probably saw you that you were at another venue and mm-hmm. looked at that way. But, um, you know, you, you certainly, I mentioned to you before your promo stuff, it's all really looks really good and, and makes sense. And, um, you can watch the video and you get a really good sense that the shows, what the show is. And, and I've, I'm not afraid if, if I get a promo video from an artist, I did this not too long ago and the promo video wasn't very good and I couldn't get a sense at all from getting the promo video, what the show was. It mm. was basically a, a pre-recorded album. It was the person's album and they were in a theater, you know, there was a little bits of them setting up and getting ready for the show and they played a, a song from their CD and everyone was faking it and, and there's nobody in the crowd and it was, that was about it. And I was like, uh, <laughs> I didn't get a sense of anything here. Yeah. Like, but it was well shot. It looked good. It looked professional. And I wrote back and I told the person, I said, as a buyer, I don't get anything from this video. You'd be better off taking an iPhone back to the mix position and do a straight on shot and then we watch the show for 20 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. And then I really get the sense of what's going on, even though you think that would probably be not a, you know, well, that wouldn't look very good or I don't need high production. It's honest though. Yeah. I really need yeah. to know what the show is. And you, you, I think after a while you get good at figuring out, you know, looking at a promo video pretty quickly, whether this is going to be good or not. We were about to film uh, film another one or at least more footage to put together another video because the first one we did in 2015 October and then the second one which has the live footage Beginning we did in November of, yeah so the last thing we did we, we put out was from a performance in 2016 and the show has changed yeah so much and we sing these songs differently at that moment we were we were coming at the this material from a different place like we we weren't i'd say over the last three years we've gotten just obsessed with old country music and and so now the way that we approach it is less less from like a rock and roll standpoint and more from the country standpoint and that changes that changes everything like even tell with the drums like uh, you know trying to keep things we love playing the the stripped down sets where it's literally just a snare drum yeah, with brushes like that. Th- those are super fun because um, all of a sudden uh, articulation of the vocals comes out in a different way because there's no symbols or yeah uh, little things like that. Um, I know that's a tangent, but um, but yeah, we need to make another video and but uh, the something thing honest, that, honest, yeah, honesty and you know. and it, trying to trans like make it translucent or or just uh, transparent that there's no you know filters or anything just to, what the moment is and what the spirit is and yeah that's a tough thing to do it's uh, what's well, tough thing to when you're putting something together it may look good to you but then you don't always flip it around to realize well okay does the person buying this does this make sense to them it may make sense to the person coming to see the show as you know a patron going to the website and checking things out so, oh that looks really great you know blah, 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 it's gonna be fun but then as you know, the website's kind of half there for that, half there to really sell the project when, you know, a buyer goes and takes a look at it. Yeah. yeah. Um, and sometimes it, you almost need a separate one, you know, think about it almost two different ways or try to, you know, make the one that works for, for the both purposes. And I think what we did with that video, we tried to put in 
little bit of songs and then a little bit of talking so that to show that we tell history and then that we joke a little bit but well that's a big part because a lot of people can sing the songs but so many artists have no idea what a show is yeah or how to talk in between songs or what to say or i've i've seen a bunch of those where just you know the person's singing great and then it gets in between the songs and they're it just oh all of a sudden the level of the show comes way down because they don't know how to talk or what to say or yes it's it's just it's like cooking and you gotta you gotta keep tending to that you know to the the sizzle and there's stuff. just as much art for me in that as it is in in the in the totally singing. yeah yeah and that that's we were lucky with the other project that we had it, it kind of because it did kind of force us out of our shell a bit and then the old place yeah that forced was us that was the big one where it's like okay you come out you know we used to come out with our other band and we wouldn't even say anything we would just go straight into the song yeah and. I mean that's cool. That's as long as you do address the audience eventually. But this this has been so different. It's like eyes pe- give people the whites of your eyes, you know, so they could the window of the soul. People want to see that, and and just I, I love the way that Buck Owens is with audiences. Like every time when I watch the Buck Owens show, I think it's the funniest thing, even though it's not in front of an audience. But the live stuff that he did, like Carnegie Hall. Yeah, it's it may, like the way he and Don Rich were were so goofy, and they were just doing their nightclub act at Carnegie Hall, but the music was so good that they could be so goofy, and the music could be so good. I just love that. Yeah, yeah. Well, the hard thing too is when you're doing a show like what you're doing, and and maybe in the past you used to you know you play a song or two or whatever, and you can you know you can stop, you could take a drink, and you know and people chat a little bit or whatever, and you just you know plonk and tune and. Okay, it's uh, we're gonna do another one now, and you can't do that. No, it's got to be. You got to finish, and you got to be. No, it's it's got to be ready. To go. You don't have time. Yeah. you guys don't have time to take a drink of water. No, no, it's I mean, it's showbiz. Like yeah. it's it's a it's amazing how five seconds will feels so long. Yeah, in between a song, if if I'm like even if I'm just struggling with my strap, I'm like I'm like darn it, I got to get that done. Yeah, yeah well, dead, the, dead air is just that's oh, the most uncomfortable. Oh thing yeah, for yeah, everybody. <laughs> yeah, we're just trying to when those moments happen, like you know, trying to turn them into something, you know, is always the challenge. And um, yeah, I mean, there's so many things we have to con- consistently, as we acknowledged earlier, get just keep getting better at and. Yeah. And all that, like our online presence with videos is really dismal, even though we do have a couple of things, but like, you know, it's another thing that we want to like make actual, like do like an A side and B side of, of their songs and then have a little moment where we tell a bit about the history of it. And if we did like 30 or 40 of those, you know, and have them online, we could feel more comfortable just saying, Hey folks, like we have like a whole online channel where we do these like in-depth studies on these two songs or these two songs. And that way we, we, we could actually focus on other things in our show and we could just direct people to our YouTube channel and yeah. say, Hey, if you want to know more about the, the say side and B side, check yeah. it out. Cause one of the hard things that we talk about with Burley all the time about this show is that like the, one of the hardest things is choosing what songs not to do because yeah. there's so many good ones and like, we love this music, but like there's certain things you have to play for, obvious reasons and yeah. but yeah so it's we're, we've got a lot to learn we have a lot so. <laughs> and just like <laughs> you were saying do. earlier that 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 the making records and being on the road are almost ha- incompatible like you need to take that time to to make a record I, i'm amazed by people that you know just record in their hotel rooms and manage to to and it's amazing that people manage to do that but i just feel so much more comfortable having time alone at my house where it's quiet and I can, I can really dig into something and we need to have a balance in our lives. And all it's been for the last three or four years has been shows and we need to make, make some good records. So 2020 is a, is, you know, the beginning of a new, um, it's already begun. Yeah. It's already begun. And like you mentioned before, also just having another life, like being able to maybe have a family someday. Like yeah. things like that or so how do your um what do your parents think of the show it's i mean they're our our, our dad i mean we talked to him now because we're we're getting to 
play in theaters that we were in when we were kids backstage that yeah. he was performing in, which is like, what a crazy like turnaround just to have this full circle thing. Um, so, I mean, we constantly talk to him on the phone just about like, oh, where you, he's checking in, where are you guys today? Oh, I, I did this show there in, in like, you know, yeah. in 87 or it's just, it's cool to have that connection with our father, like that we're kind of, you know, he sees us in that light now as a, you know, and they're, they're just so glad that we're, we're out here together yeah, like out there doing something together. Because uh, I mean that that was encouraged when we were younger, and and I I know I always tried to include you, I, you know, giving you guitars and playing on your record when you're, yeah, yeah, yeah. what are you twelve? Yeah, uh, <laughs> some oh, yeah, funny songs, real good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember uh, women's self defense. Yeah, kick them in the wang. All right. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you know, not all our jams, you know. It's, <laughs> but yeah, they're just happy we're we're out doing something together, and we've we've found uh, something that works for us naturally. And mm-hmm. they and and they can't tell you the, how good it felt to have our parents come out and stay with us at our house. Like that yeah. was a big deal. Like that first night where we all got in bed and I'm like, wow, they're comfortable in our house. Like it, it just like it made me teary because that was the what happened in 2015 was like just kept thinking they've taken care of me their whole lives. And what have I done? You know, I'm just writing these self, you know, fulfilling songs. And, and I, it was just, it felt so good to have the last three years or four years kind of reach that point where they were comfortable in our home. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, they're, I mean, we feel that they're very proud. Like they let us know that too. And we want to keep earning that. <laughs> every day so. yeah that's important yeah well uh appreciate you spending uh this time chatting it was a great chat yeah. uh Thank we appreciate so what you're doing and and wish you all the best and hopefully we get to do a whole bunch of stuff uh in the future together i think it would be uh it'd be a blast i hope so I hope too so. Darren. Yeah, thank seriously. you so much for having us this has been such a fruitful conversation and I and just to meet it. your whole family and see you guys all working together it's it's super inspiring. So thank you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we uh, we we enjoy it. We always say it's uh, it's a ton of work, uh, but for us it's neat because you when you're done at the end of the day, you just you're you know, you're home. Yeah, <laughs> you know, and you know yeah. how important that is, and and you know you're setting the roots up now, and and uh, it's nice to go out, and I enjoy getting out and touring, but it's it's I think the older you get, the more you appreciate home time and and mm. and this oh man the, sitting on the back deck and just listening to the wind go through the trees is it's, it's like the greatest thing in the world yeah you know so. yeah all right well i'm looking forward to the next few days finishing up the week here and uh indeed and uh, we're gonna have a good time thanks again thank, thank you. you darren